Good evening, church. It's good to see each and every one of you here. One of the families who came in today uh, told me that uh, her child could not wait for a night, can't wait to go to bed so that he can wake up in the morning and open his gifts. And don't worry, guys, this isn't going to be long. You're almost there. It's almost Christmas time. And my wife uh, has the same sentiment. She tells me every Christmas, keep it short. Nobody wants to hear you talk. We want to celebrate Christmas. We want to go and be with our families. We want to do things. So keep it short. So for the next 40 minutes, I want to talk to you. <laughs> I'm just, for those of you who guess, I'm just teasing. I don't even preach that long on a, on a Sunday morning, much less at Christmas night. But if you are keeping track, you may want to take note that the title of the sermon is Christmas Has consequences. Luke is a very interesting writer of the Gospels. He works almost like a director of films in which he goes back and forth and cuts back and forth in scenes, taking a wide angle lens and a wide camera lens in order to give context, in order to help people find their bearings and find their place in the story. And then Luke will turn the camera and focus in on the point of his Gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Luke chapter 2 is no different. Luke starts out with a wide camera angle lens to give you the context. A census is going on, decreed by the emperor, and it is policy that each person ought to register and make note that he is not only has a family, but is able to work or perhaps be conscripted into the military and especially pay taxes. Now, I don't think this is a mistake that Luke starts here. You have to put yourself in the shoes of those people who lived during this time where Mary and Joseph were in that place and day. The consensus was a very bold move on part of the Roman Empire. It reminded everyone of who was in charge. It reminded everyone that they had to pay taxes. It reminded everyone of who ran the military. And though during that, those days and age, that day and age, there was plenty of peace to go around, peace often came through violence and warfare and military might. It was also used as an intimida intimidation tool because it reminded the people far off outside of Italy, outside of Rome, of who was in charge and who held Israel captive. You have to remember your Advent stories at this time. The angels came to Mary and to Joseph to Elizabeth and to Zechariah to tell them that the day of the Lord was upon them, that Mary was indeed going to give birth to the Messiah, and this triggered in the Palestinian mind a hope and a joy that God was finally going to break into history to overthrow those Romans, to bring a king, a prince of peace, one who will come and wipe out Israel's oppressors and allow Israel to be what God had called Israel to be a long time ago, to be a light to the nations, a blessing to the nations, but a liberated country, one in which they will no longer be enslaved or shackled, no longer held captive by those Roman oppressors. This is the wide camera lens that Luke shows in this story. We start with the power and the might of the emperor who would have surely been known in that day and age as the son of God are actually, to the Romans, the son of the gods. It was years and years ago that the emperor himself decreed that he was a divine being, and so the census was not only a matter of policy, but a matter of theology of who was in charge. And I think Luke is purposeful in starting in this place in the Christmas story. Because in the face of that kind of might and military power, in the face of that kind of, of violence and intimidation, Luke shifts his camera angle and narrows in very, onto a very small area in Bethlehem, not to a fancy palace, not to the temple, not to the home of those who would have been part of the elite in that day and age, but rather to a lean-to on the side of the house in a manger with the cows mooing and the lambs by, or the sheep's by, right? What, what do camels make? Do camels make any noises? Lambs don't moo. Cows moo. Lambs bark. <laughs> Bryce said they do like a hee sound. Okay, we'll take that. And we're in the 
this manger, we're in this little lean-to, and here, born not in the midst of power, but to a peasant family, this very vulnerable, very fragile baby, Jesus Christ, who breaks out in the midst of night, a joy to the world, a promise made so long ago to be Messiah. But you and I know that he is a Messiah unlike every other, any other Messiah. He is one who continues to, rape, to grow in that type of vulnerability to walk among the poor and the destitute. He does not take his place in the palace. He doesn't take his place among the aristocracy or the priesthood or the Sadducees or the Sanhedrin or the Pharisees. He doesn't march into Rome with a war horse. Rather, he eats with tax collectors and sinners. He commingles and touches those who are sick. He talks to people that no one else would talk to. He invites people to table that will eventually betray him and turn their back on him. And wherever you find the destitute and the vulnerable, those who are grieving, those who are on the short end of the stick of life, you're surely to find Jesus there. See, Luke starts the Christmas story in that kind of setting. And I think that this setting of a vulnerable baby, of God breaking into history, of God taking on flesh, not in the midst of power, but in the midst of weakness, not just to define Jesus' ministry, but to also make that the impetus for his mission. And I think it defines Jesus, not because Jesus chooses to do that, but because that tells us who God is. And that tells us what kind of God we serve. You see, though Luke picks up the story of Christmas in a manger in some backwoods town outside of Jerusalem with a peasant family who barely had two pennies to rub together, we surely know that this is a story in which whenever we go and walk among the vulnerable and the weak, we're sure, we're sure to find Jesus. Later on in the Gospel of Matthew, around chapter 25, Jesus tells a parable in which the king comes back to reclaim his own. And Jesus tells the parable about how the king will separate the sheep from the goats. And he separates the sheep, those who are righteous, and says, Blessed are you, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was poor and you helped me. I was sick and you cured me. I was in prison and you visited me. I was naked and you clothed me. And then the goats come along and just as confused as the sheep say, where did we go wrong? Well, I was in prison and you did not visit me. I was poor and you did not care for me. I was naked and you didn't give me any clothes. I was hungry and you didn't give me any food. I was thirsty and you didn't give me anything to drink. You see, what's compelling about the Christmas story is that even though Jesus is born to a peasant family, off the beaten path that Christmas has consequences. And that wherever we are to be the church, however we are to celebrate this birthday story, however we are to allow this baby, Jesus, to impact our life, it is to continue to follow in his footsteps and to allow his ministry to unfold in those places where we least expect it. Not in the high places of power, and military might, but rather in the most vulnerable places of fragility and weakness, among the downtrodden, among those who are in need, among those who need hope, and the gospel of the good message of Jesus Christ our Lord. Where do we find Jesus crying out these days? How does Christmas have consequences among our day and age? And where might we find Jesus crying out in the wilderness once again? Perhaps we can find him in the yearning of those who are homeless who are looking for a decent wage or some sustainable housing. Perhaps we can hear Jesus cry within the coughs of a coal miner whose corporation hasn't given over, hasn't allowed for a new ventilation system to be installed. Perhaps Jesus is sitting around the table with a family who's doing their budget trying to make ends meet. Perhaps Jesus is with the caregiver who feels trapped because she's caring for her parents and she can't do what she wants to do. She can't travel because she has to be there for her father. And so she cries every night, feeling entrapped, and there we find Jesus' cry. Or perhaps we find Jesus' cry within the tears of those who grieve on a holiday where they are spending for the first time. Christmas without a loved one in their family. Or perhaps we hear Jesus' cry within the child who has leukemia and whose fate is unknown and who lives on certain days. Or perhaps we find the Christ child crying 
in the midst of our own families, where we have places where we have yet to reconcile our differences, or perhaps yet to make up because we fought the last time we got together over Christmas dinner. You see, we all on Christmas Day try to go to those places that are comfortable. We do our grocery shopping, we do our gift shopping, we wrap our gifts, we have beautiful dinners. But we have to remember that Christmas has consequences. It is more than just a celebration. It is an affirmation that when Jesus comes, not only does he save us from our sins and liberate us from our own enslavement and our own captivity, but Jesus seeks to transform those around us, to transform the communities in which we live, to make a difference in the world, to be an agent of change, and to empower us to be agents of reconciliation and of hope and of peace. When the kids go to bed tonight, or perhaps when you're turning in and it's silent and it's quiet and you turn out all the Christmas lights and you make sure all the lights outside are off and you make sure the oven is off and you're ready to go to bed and it finally gets quiet, perhaps you too, might go into those areas in your life that are off the beaten path. Perhaps the lean-tos in your life or the manjus in your life where things aren't all perfect and aren't all together, those vulnerable areas of your life, and maybe just maybe, if you listen hard enough, you'll hear the baby Jesus crying out in that darkness. Even in that place in your life where your own weakness meets the deepest needs of the world. Because Christmas has consequences. It's more than a birthday celebration. It is a time in which we are called to transform the world and to find Jesus at work in the midst of those areas in our life we least expected.